Antichrist. And in fact, it even begs the question when we talk about the Antichrist, because one of the questions that we encounter with respect to this idea of Antichrist is, is there one Antichrist or are there many Antichrists? Is Antichrist singular or plural? Uh, the second question we encounter is, is the Antichrist a person or an institution? And an even more important question is, the New Testament speaks of the Antichrist in John's epistles, and in Paul's letters he speaks of the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, and in the book of Revelation, John tells us about the beast who's known by the number 666. Well, again, are we dealing with three different subjects, the man of sin, the Antichrist, and the beast? Or are all three of these concepts interconnected and interrelated, converging on one identity? Now, those are some of the questions we'll look at in addition to the $64,000 question, and that is, who is the Antichrist, or what is the Antichrist, and how are we expected to recognize it or him? Now, as I say, there's fascination in the world, and in fact, sometimes preoccupation with the concept of the Antichrist. It's a uh, common uh, feature of interest in the world of the occult. We saw the film smash hit Rosemary's Baby, which was linked to this concept of the Antichrist, and the popular prophetess or seeress of the 20th century, Jean Dixon, prophesied several years ago that the Antichrist has already been born and as I speak, is currently maturing into adulthood and will soon uh, make himself known publicly. So those are some of the things that we encounter when we're looking at this question of the Antichrist. And the first thing I want to do is look at what the New Testament says specifically about the Antichrist, because the only place we really find out anything directly about Antichrist in those terms is in the first epistle of John. And so let's look at 1 John chapter <coughs> 2, beginning at verse 18. John writes these words, Little children, it is the last hour. Notice the time frame reference that is used here by John. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now, obviously, in this context, John is speaking of many Antichrists who already have come, and he's describing Antichrists, plural here, in terms of those who have committed the sin of apostasy, those who had once professed faith in Christ but then left the Christian community and repudiated uh, their confession. And so here, John links Antichrist with apostasy. <coughs> In chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, John gives us more information where he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. 
And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, he talks about the coming of the Antichrist. He speaks of many, many Antichrists. And he talks about the spirit of the Antichrist who is coming, but who is already in the world. So one thing is clear in John's description of Antichrist, that in his idea of Antichrist, he's talking about something that represented a clear and present danger to the first century church. Now, let's take a couple of minutes to look at the term Antichrist. Christ. What is significant is the use of the term anti, which comes directly from the Greek anti, which has two distinct meanings in the Greek language. Usually, and that is uh, most frequently, the term anti means against. But sometimes the prefix anti in Greek means in place of. Now, if it merely means anti, then the Antichrist is defined in terms of his opposition to Christ. He is one who is against Christ. The term, if used in its secondary sense of anti, would be somebody who subverts or seeks to uh, replace Christ as a false substitute. He is a supplanter, a false Messiah. Now, we don't necessarily have to choose between these two possible meanings or renderings of the term onti in Greek because anyone, obviously, who sought to supplant the true office of Christ as a false Messiah, as a false Christ, would by the, same, by the same action be working against Christ. And so the idea is suggested here that the Antichrist is one who both works against Christ and tries to become a substitute for Christ, that is, is a false god or false messiah. Now, in addition to John's teaching specifically, uh, using the language of Antichrist, we have the teaching of the Apostle Paul in his writings to the Thessalonian Christians in uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 4, beginning, we have it in 2 Thessalonians, chapter Two, I'll get it, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Let's look at this text, if we may. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 11. <coughs> Paul begins by saying, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie 
that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now again, the context in which Paul talks about this mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is in response to trouble that was brewing in the Thessalonican community that Paul speaks of at the beginning of uh, 2 Thessalonians when he says, I don't want you people to be upset by reports that allegedly have come from me. Somebody had been circulating in the church false rumors that had allegedly come from Paul, and one of those false rumors was that, that the Christ had already come. And Paul is now writing to correct that misapprehension and reminds them of what he had said to them formerly when he was in their midst, that certain things had to take place before the coming of Jesus. Now, obviously, they were expecting a very quick appearance of Jesus, and some had actually been convinced that or had heard the rumor that he had returned. Paul says, not yet, because before that takes place, we have to have the appearance of this man of lawlessness, uh, and so on. Now let's look at it again. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And now he's referring to an apostasy. That's what it means to fall away, a repudiation of true faith. Now remember the difference between paganism and apostasy. A pagan is one who is an unbeliever who has never made a profession of faith. An apostate is someone who makes a profession of faith and then later repudiates that profession of faith. That is, an apostate can only be someone who is within the covenant community, within the visible church. Uh, Benjamin Warfield is convinced that in this text, <coughs> Paul is not talking about an apostasy that will take place at the end of history in the uh, manifestation of wickedness and moral decline within the Christian church. He's talking about the apostasy of the Jews in the first century, which was a major problem uh, that is recounted in the New Testament. Christ came to his own, his own received him not, Paul had this tremendous ongoing burden for his own kinsmen according to the flesh, Israel. The author of Hebrews warns that current generation of Jewish people about the dire danger of neglecting the great salvation that had come. And so the apostasy of the Jews or the apostasy of the Israel of Israel is tied to that generation of Jews who rejected the Messiah that had appeared in their midst. And that would indicate a great falling away. But then Paul goes on to say, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Now, one of the reasons why Biblical scholars and commentators believe that Paul is here describing the same thing that John is talking about in his letter with respect to the term Antichrist, because Paul describes the man of sin in two basic ways. He first of all opposes Christ. He is against Christ. He is anti-Christ. And second of all, he exalts himself above all that is God and claims uh, the right to be worshipped and so on. So that in this case, the man of sin or the man of lawlessness is one who is anti-Christ in both senses of the word anti that I uh, spelled out a few moments ago. Well, what else does Paul say about uh, the anti or the uh, man of lawlessness. That he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now here he describes the man of lawlessness of actually being seated in the temple. 
Now, if those words are to be taken literally, then you have the one of two options. Either this occurred while the Herodian temple was still standing, or it must refer to a future event that will require the rebuilding of the temple. That's why many uh, people today, particularly among dispensationalists, believe that there will be, because there must be, not only the restoration of the Jews to the land of Palestine, but the reconstruction of the temple and the reinstitution of the sacrificial systems for the final appearance of Antichrist to take place as he literally is seated in the temple. This business about desecrating the religion of Israel and the temple of God also links Paul's description of the man of lawlessness to Jesus' Olivet Discourse when Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation, which was linked to one who would commit some kind of serious form of blasphemous sacrilege, which Jesus also spoke of in terms of the signs that he predicted in the Olivet Discourse. <clears throat> now, then Paul goes on to say, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, just as John talks about the Antichrist being already in the world and already working, so Paul, in his description of the man of lawlessness, this mysterious person, as being presently already at work. But he says that in the present situation, this man of lawlessness is being held in restraint. Now, one of the great mysteries of the New Testament is not only the identity of the man of lawlessness or the identity of the Antichrist, but the question of the identity of the one who restrains or the restrainer. <clears throat> now, one of the most fascinating uh, and I think, frankly, bizarre uh, arguments that dispensational uh, scholars bring for their view of the pre-tribulation rapture, the view that the church will be taken out of the, uh, the world before the last tribulation, the arguments I've read have gone like this, that the only one who really can operate as the restrainer of evil in this world is the Holy Spirit. So the first assumption is that the uh, restrainer of the second chapter of Thessalonians, uh, or the first second chapter of Second Thessalonians, is uh, is the Holy Spirit. And then the the speculation goes like this: since the Holy Spirit indwells Christians, the only way the Holy Spirit could be taken away, the only way the full restraining power of the Holy Spirit could be removed from the planet would be you'd have to remove every Christian from the planet. So they see this as a, a, a sort of disguised uh, of teaching of the uh, pre-tribulation rapture, which I think is uh, a really unwarranted speculation. We don't know who the restrainer is. It may simply be uh, the restraints of God who restrains evil. But he, since he speaks in, in uh, specific terms of an individual, uh, some have suggested, or uh, an institution, that the restraining uh, power here is an institution like the Roman government. Or some scholars have suggested that the one who was actively restraining the man of lawlessness at this point in time was Paul himself. And that, again, it's speculation because we don't know uh, what it is that's restraining or who it is that's restraining the man of lawlessness. All we are told is that he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now he goes on to say the coming of the lawless one is according to the, waken, the, to the working of Satan 
with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception <clears throat> among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, etc. Now, here it seems to suggest that the man of lawlessness will be endowed with supernatural powers, uh, giving lying signs and wonders, and will be working in concert with Satan. Now these elements of the description of the man of lawlessness, who is already at work here, correspond in a remarkable fashion with the description that we get of the beast of Revelation, whose mark is the mark 666. But what I'm going to do in our next lecture is to focus attention on the beast of the book of Revelation. And, but before I do that, let me suggest to you that the preliminary study that we have done indicates strongly, I believe, and I would say the majority report um, in historic Christian scholarship, is that the figure of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and the beast in the book of Revelation all refer to one and the same thing. So that whatever light we can learn from the Antichrist will teach us something about the man of lawlessness. Conversely, whatever we can discern about the meaning of the man of lawlessness will tell us something about the Antichrist. And again, whatever we learn about the Antichrist and the man of lawlessness will shed light on our understanding of the uh, mysterious beast who is introduced to us in the apocalyptic literature of the book of Revelation. And again, we are left with still with the question, person or institution? Is this something that happened in the first century once and for all? Or was there some uh, archetypal manifestation of this uh, person or institution in the first century? But we can expect a fuller manifestation later on in history. These are some of the questions that remain on the table as we wrestle with the the meaning. Thank you.